Welcome to video 62 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video we're going to introduce the concept of an embedded curve. And in the process we'll derive expressions for the metric equation and the arc length in terms of surface coordinates. We've seen this sort of diagram several times before. What we've got is a curve through space, the yellow line, and on it is a point P and we locate point P with the arc length that is measured from the beginning of the curve. So our arc length is a value of s. Now back in video 15, we derived expressions for the metric equation and the arc length. If you'll remember, they look like this. If you need a review, again, go back to video 15 and see how we developed these expressions relative to a curve going through space. OK, but now let's suppose that this is not just a curve through space, but it's also a curve that is located on a surface. In other words, if we have a surface like this, let's assume that we've actually constructed this curve to lie on the surface itself. In other words, every point on this curve is also a point on the surface. Well, um, according to our definition then, we know that the curve is a one-dimensional manifold. We know that the surface is a two-dimensional manifold. And if all the points in the curve are located on the surface, then what we've got is a one-dimensional manifold that is embedded inside a two-dimensional manifold. And neither the submanifold nor the, the surface is a Euclidean space. So what we've got here is a one-dimensional submanifold that's non-Euclidean that's embedded in a two-dimensional submanifold that is also non-Euclidean. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Well, um, where do we want to take this? Well, let's do this. Let's uh, explore this expression, s alpha dotted with s beta. These are our surface covariant basis vectors. We're going to find the dot product of these two. And we're going to use our expression for the shift tensor that we developed uh, in previous videos. So we can replace s alpha with z i alpha times zi. And then we're going to find the dot product of that with this expression. And here we've got uh, z with beta in the lower position. And of course, I can't use i again because I'm using that already. So I use j here. And then times z j. All right, well, what do we got? Well, um, this thing right here is our surface covariant metric tensor. And these two guys dotted together are going to give us our ambient covariant metric tensor. So this expression then leads to the following result. You see it up here. We've got this expression right here. We've got these two together with this. And of course, these last two terms that follow along like that. So what we've done is to derive the expression for the surface covariant metric tensor in terms of our ambient covariant metric tensor using a combination of two shift tensor factors like this. OK, well, what's next? Well, again, if you go back to video 15, you'll notice, uh, you'll, you'll see there that we used an expression that involved this, this zi, our coordinates, as a function of some parameter t. And it was uh, using this kind of uh, relationship that led us to the derivation of these expressions you see here. But we now know that because the points are on the surface as well as in ambient space, we can also express this e equation this way. We can make zi a function, first of all, of s, that is our surface coordinates s. Um, unfortunately, there's a little overlap here. This s is just the arc length of the curve, but this s is the, the uh, two surface coordinates that map out our surface here. And then this is in turn a function of t, so we can get this composite function. So now we'll um, perform our operation of taking the derivative. Well, this time it's just an ordinary derivative because t is a single variable. It's not a multivariable function here. So it's going to be dz dt. And on the right side, we have to use uh, 
the partial derivative because s is not a single variable here. It's our, our surface coordinate. So the first factor is going to be the partial of zi with respect to s alpha. And then we'll have the follow-up, which is the ordinary derivative of s alpha with respect to t. Okay, well, what have we got now? Well, surely you recognize that this is the shift tensor. And so that uh, relationship is expressed this way. We have this derivative here. We have this derivative here. And we've got our shift tensor here in the middle. So this gives us yet another relationship that we can express using the concept of this embedded curve. Now, one other thing that we can do, we can multiply everything through by dt, and we come up with the differential form, which is simply this. So eliminating dt from the denominator on both sides, we have the differential of zi, which is equal to the shift tensor, times the differential of s alpha. All right, well, let's use these new expressions then to see if we can find a different way of writing this expression. Well, if we're going to do that, we will have uh, zij. But instead of dzi, let's use this expression right here. And that's zi alpha s uh, ds alpha. And then for dzj, similar expression, but we need to use, first of all, j to match the free index or the this uh, index of j here and of course i can't use alpha again because i'm already using it here so we'll use beta and we have uh, z j beta times d s beta okay what do we have well notice if i combine this factor this factor and this factor i just have this expression right here in other words, all three of these things combined together are just our surface covariant metric tensor. And that, in turn, leads to the fact that this expression over here will now look just like this. It's simply our surface covariant metric tensor times each of our differential factors right there. Okay, and of course, um, having expressed uh, this in this way, obviously we can re-express our formula for the arc length to look like this. So we have uh, expressions that will give us the, the metric of our, our uh, space here, either in ambient terms or in surface terms. It's the self-same value here, but just two different ways of expressing the same result. And likewise, the length of our arc can be calculated either using the uh, values in the ambient space or in the surface space like this. We'll get exactly the same value here if we perform either of these two operations. Now I'm sure it's quite obvious to you that this form is identical to this form. And this one is identical to this one. So this is yet another example where the results that we derived originally for Euclidean spaces applies to non-Euclidean spaces. In fact, we developed uh, this concept back in video 15. And if you remember in video 59, where we covered the common baseline elements, I said that everything we did through the first 26 videos is applicable to all manifolds and not just Euclidean spaces. So I could have included all of this in video 59 and just be, have been done with it there. But I wanted to present it to you this way so that you begin to see the utility of our shift tensor. Our shift tensor is not only used to relate the basis vectors between the ambient and the submanifold, but it's going to show up in a number of different ways too. And this is a great example of how we can use the shift tensor to relate the covariant uh, metric tensors between the ambient and the surface uh, perspectives. Okay, well, now that we've done this, I mean, you may be looking at it and saying to yourself, well, that's interesting, but does it have any real practical value? Well, um, I think so, and let's uh, look at it this way. I have two different ways of finding the arc length here, either of these two methods. I can either use the, the ambient uh, covariant metric tensor with these products and do this integration, or this one. Which one would I rather do? Well, that's answered by the fact of just looking at how many expressions or terms are going to be. Here, with indexes i and j, each index can have values of 1, 2, or 3, which means 
inside this uh, integral there could be as many as nine terms in this radical. However, in our surface uh, expression, alpha and beta can only be one or two, so the maximum number of terms here is four. All right, in other words, um, what we see is that the use of the surface coordinates should produce a simpler, less complicated expression to evaluate than if we did it in the ambient perspective. Now the reason that happens is the reason that all of this works. And that is, you'll remember when we're dealing with a sub-manifold of two dimensions that's embedded in a three-dimensional manifold, we in effect lose one degree of freedom. So everything that we were doing in three dimensions one way is now being done in two dimensions instead of three. The fact that we are constraining the points of our curve on the surface reduces the freedom of the, uh, the, the number of degrees of freedom in the work we're doing from three to two, and therefore the expression becomes simpler. So it's a lot easier to evaluate this in a two-dimensional space than this in a three-dimensional space. So anytime we can use the two-dimensional form, we should, as opposed to the three-dimensional. All right, um, all that having been said, let's jump over and see what these metric equations look like for each of our sample surfaces. We'll start with our cylindrical surface. And you're going to see real quick that this is just a trivial exercise. We have our formula for our metric equation here. And forming the correct result is just a matter of walking through each of the components of our covariant metric tensor over here. So um, we'll take the first one. Uh, S11 is just A squared. And then that's going to be times DS1 and DS1, which is DS1 squared, which in this case is just D theta squared. And then uh, the only other non-zero element in our covariate metric tensor is, is uh, S22, which is 1. So the last expression is going to be just DS2 times DS2. DS2 is uh, DZ, so we're going to have DZ squared. And that's our end result. So we'll move down here and simply add the metric equation to look like this. And of course, that leads us directly to the expression for the arc length to look like this. And with that, we're done. These are the two expressions for our cylindrical surface. So we'll uh, move on now to the spherical surface. The spherical surface, it's a trivial matter as well. We simply walk through each of these non-zero elements of our covariant metric tensor. We've got, first of all, A squared, which we'll multiply by DZ1 squared, which is D theta squared. And the only other one to consider is the last one, which is A squared sine squared theta times DZ2 squared, which is just D phi squared. So that then is our metric equation. So we'll just move down and insert that here. And that leads us logically to the arc length to look like this. So it's that easy. These are our two expressions for the spherical surface. All right, and finally the uh, torus. And for the torus, we go through the same exercise. We just take each of our non-zero elements of our covariant metric tensor. And um, we'll have, first of all, A plus B cosine phi squared times DZ1 squared, which is D theta squared. And the second term is just B squared times DZ2 squared, which for the torus is D phi squared. And that's going to be our expression for the metric equation, which looks like this. And the arc length looks like this. So these are the results for the torus. OK, so um, with that, let's uh, wind the video down with a brief recap. The first thing we did was to derive an expression that relates our ambient covariant metric tensor here to our surface covariant metric tensor. And we do it by adding a couple of uh, factors consisting of our shift tensor. Now, because this is a tensor equation, we can automatically do this. We can switch the position of every index in the equation, and that means that our contravariant metric tensors relate 
in a similar fashion using the inverse values for our shift tensor. Okay, the next thing we did was this. We found an expression that relates a curve that is uh, parameterized on our surface to a curve, the same curve parameterized using our ambient coordinates, and the relationship simply requires the addition of our shift tensor here. Now we can multiply this by dt, and what we get is a form of it in the uh, differential form here. So um, this relates our surface differential to our ambient differential. Okay, using these relationships, we were able to derive the metric equation for the surface, it's here, and the arc length, which is this expression. Now let me point out real quick that this S right here is not our surface coordinates. This is the arc length of the curve, while these re represent the uh, surface coordinates. Okay, now uh, we also pointed out, of course, uh, what's probably very obvious, and that is that both of these forms are exactly the same as the forms we derived back in video number 15. So that tells us that both the metric equation and the surface uh, arc length are examples of uh, results that are the same uh, for all manifolds and not just for Euclidean spaces. Okay, and finally we pointed out that uh, performing an operation like this is easier, simpler, if we can do it in surface coordinates instead of ambient coordinates because there will be fewer terms. So anytime we can look at a curve as a sub-manifold of a surface, then we can apply this expression, and the calculation should be easier when we do it. All right, in the next video, what we're going to do is um, take a closer examination of the normal.